All right, welcome back to the 35th episode of the Luxury Lunch and Learn. We launched this way back on April 10th due to COVID-19, and we've had various industry leaders uh, sharing insights as to best practices and what their agents, or in this case, some of their best coaching clients are doing to adapt and bring value to the marketplace, stay relative, and thrive uh, during this uncertain time. So I'm really honored to have the uh, VP of MAPS Coaching with, uh, from Keller Williams, Monica Reynolds. Monica, thank you so much for being with me today. I appreciate it. This is a great opportunity, and I look forward to having a conversation with you. Well, you got a beautiful home office there, and we were talking a little bit offline, and that's the, that's the new office uh, uh, since uh, March 13th, uh, it's Friday. Yeah, but let me, let, me, let me share with you. This is my jail cell. I've been in here since March 13th, every single day, about 10 hours in this chair. I am now going to hire a gamer chair, a gaming chair. You know, I've got four grandsons upstairs uh, on Fortnite. But I'm going to get a gaming chair because you sit in it so long, this chair is getting worn out. And so, you know, yeah, this is my home office. It's my office. And so in this kind of a, the COVID environment, we've all gone home to the home office. And if you didn't have one, you're looking at which room you can switch around or what backgrounds you have. Um, it's the, the digital world showed up on us pretty fast, didn't it? It, it really did. And uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, and I remember the day like it was yesterday. It was, it was Friday the 13th of March. So uh, we're all adapting and uh, really, really honored to have you here. And I tell everybody a little bit uh, about your background. Um, obviously, I shared offline. I, I was a Dave Ramsey endorsed uh, agent and, and you led some trainings for Dave. But you've been uh, leading and coaching and doing some amazing things for team leaders and, and, and office uh, staff. And, and now you're VP of uh, Keller Williams Maps Coaching. So give a little quick background on your, your story, if you would. Yeah, i am almost been in real estate 40 years when dinosaurs were walking around. No cell phones, of course, and no cars. No, we did have cars. But that was about it, right? And um, I started my career in, real, in Fargo, North Dakota. And um, at the time, uh, in 1984, interest rates were, I started in the early, early 80s, maybe 79. And what happened there is that what we were faced with as a real estate agent was my loan on my house was 16 and a half percent interest in 1984. In 1984, a woman like myself who was making three, four hundred thousand dollars a year could not get a loan. I made more money than the bank presidents, doctors in town. I couldn't get a loan because you had to have a cosigner in 1984. I got an insurance company to loan me some money to build this house. But anyway, long story short, Rates were 16 and a half. And that was a good rate. Um, FHA, VA were 17, 18, prime was 21%. So you look at those rates and you go, how does anybody sell a house there? Gosh, that was a great way to, you know, cut your teeth on coming into real estate and really building a good career. So I hired my first assistant, which I guess I'm known for. I dug the well on that. Uh, in the early 80s, got thrown out of a Cowell Banker office, loved Cowell Banker, got a lot of great, great training there, but I got thrown out because they brought assistant in in the early 80s, and they said, is she licensed? And I said, no, and they said, well, you got to go, you to liability. I did more business than all of the agents together, and yet they were willing to let me go. So that's fine, I started my own company, and the rest was history. And I wrote a couple of books in the 90s, a fun story is I was, um, uh, featured speaker uh, in the early 90s. I wrote a book on assistants and I wrote a book on the professional assistant and they're all on Amazon. Don't buy them. They're all, they're all great, but they're basics, but you know, new stuff's out that's better that I've done. One of the things, there's a guy that came up to me. You'll like this story, Michael. A guy came up to me last time I was in the gym, you know, Chicago in the early 90s. And he says, you're the person that wrote that book on assistants. I go, yeah. Now remember, this is four and everybody's going, no, 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 I'm not having an assistant. You can't, my, my people are special to me, my files, nobody would understand that. And so he asked me all these questions and I'm going, what the, who was that guy? And they said, oh, that's that Gary Keller guy that's starting a franchise, Keller whatever. And I go, good luck with that. And here I am, I work for him, right? Oh Oh, I've never heard circle. that story. That's a great story. Yeah, and I also told Mo Anderson, she probably should maybe rethink that job with Gary. Are you sure you want to move there? <laughs> so, so yeah, I've got some really great things on that. 
And so, then, um, so you lived in Chicago then? I met, well, I met Gary the first time in Chicago, and then he asked me several times to come and build maps uh, coaching for Keller Williams. It just wasn't the right time for me. I said no correctly. Um, it would, I would not have been the right foundation builder, um, but I'm, I'm where I need to be today, and that's exactly yeah. it. I'm the right person now. And so from there, I went to California because I didn't like the sales price in Fargo, North Dakota. At 60000 I went up to 300000 I thought, okay, I can sell houses. I'm going there. So I went there and I partnered with an individual. We're in the early 90s, we're selling three, 400 homes a year. From there, I started uh, doing more training on assistance and basically dug the well on the training on that. And then from there, I became a full-time coach. I've coached more um, agents um, hours than anyone in the country. And the next thing then I ended up running uh, Chris Heller's team. He netted a million dollars every year for seven years. I took all the listings with another person that he and I went together, took 150 to 175 listings a year, which was great. And on so, every other day, huh? <laughs> yeah, so I know how to build a seventh level team. I know how the rainmaker who doesn't come back, uh, you know, gets a million dollars every year. And then uh, everything led to me taking over maps last year or July 17th. So I'm I've hit my one year anniversary. That's awesome. Right, I like it. Yeah, well you got a ton of energy, a ton of experience, I love it. Um, you know, as I mentioned, I sat through your training when I was with uh, an endorsed uh, Dave Ramsey agent and I was very impressed and uh, I, I'm on your email list for assistance and, and uh, we've been trying to get you on our program for some time. So really excited about it. Obviously, uh, you mentioned going from uh, $60,000 average sale price to 300 way back, you know, 20 something plus years ago. So you're, you're, you know, making five times uh, selling a $300,000 home than a 60,000. And that's one of the things that we, we teach agents, Monica, is to break down the barriers and, and to increase the average sale price. You know, there's a right. lot of downward pressure, even pre COVID-19. And, and I had on our 64th podcast, we actually released our 100th podcast today, uh, but on our 64th podcast, we had a gentleman named Kevin Foreman on. And Kevin talked about how, because of disruptors, uh, um, you know, I'm not going to name the brokerages, but there's brokerages that, that discount and there's uh, the I buyers and, and a lot of other less friction out there in the real estate transaction. He, he believes that um, fees are going to go down significantly. And so one of the things I teach agents is bring more value and increase your average sale price. And, and then you can work smarter, not harder. So um, my first question to you is, um, more around COVID-19. Obviously, you're working from the home office, so that's pretty self-explanatory. But how else has MAPS and how else has Keller Williams, I guess, pivoted the, the word before COVID-19, the most pop, uh, popular word on, on stages at conferences was disruptor. I think yeah. pivoted, pivoted well, is probably the, the next one now. So uh, talk to me about pivoting uh, during this, uh, this pandemic. Yeah, who would have thought a year ago I'd be talking about pandemics, right? And everything else that's going on. So we pivoted really hard and fast. And um, I work in an organization. I have 28 um, administrative, what I call the success team that work with me. And I've got three other leaders that work with me. So we pivoted pretty hard and fast. And we had the opportunity. We're the biggest real estate company in the world. And as far we were able to tell our clients right up front whether they needed it or not. We cut their fees in half for two months, okay? We brought new clients on for free for two months. And so we really pivoted hard and fast. So I could say we grew, we didn't go backwards, we grew, which is phenomenal because most companies really took a big hit. But did our coaches step up at a high level? You bet. So instead of having a coaching call, you also got an eye care call. How are you doing? What's going on? Let's get your home office set up. Your schedule doesn't have to change. You will have a bigger year than you've ever had. We have clients that are having these massive, unbelievable years because they pivoted hard and fast too. Their staff may have gone home, their buyer agents may have gone home, but they pivoted hard and fast with the videos, with the Zoom calls. Every single day I'm on a Zoom call with my staff and my success team. And we're talking about what they're doing on, what they happen, what their questions are. So we're staying connected. When you lose that physical connection, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. In the digital world, we are not leaving for quite a while. 
There will be physical enhancements and little pockets of time where we can have some physical enhancements if it's safe, of course. And yet we are in the physical digital world. So if you didn't jump in fast, you better jump in now. There is no going back. And, you know, I sold a, a house. It was, um, it was a $3 million house uh, and it closed on March 11th, right? Nice. Oh, and I did everything digitally. I never went back to the house after eight months. My agent took care of it that I hired. And then I had a notary and I, the day before closing, I'm such a knucklehead, I didn't sign any of the paperwork and I was gonna do it digitally anyway. It's 11 o'clock at night, I click on, they said, oh, the notary will be available 24 hours a day. I click on, we go through the paperwork, sign my whole closing was 22 minutes. Now, oh Arizona can do notarize.com, some states can do that. And yet for busy people and executive type people that luxury agents hang out with, you want to be able to do those things to make it efficient. Most of them are D's like me. I don't read paperwork, just put it in front of me. I'm gonna <laughs> click through it, right? I, yeah. I mean, I looked at the closing statement, right? Sure, but, sure. But, but nothing else past that. So I want you to hear that is that you've got to embrace the digital world and executives want the digital world. Do they want in luxury? Do they want handholding? Do they want that relationship? Yes, but they also want you to be fast, precise, and to the point. Uh -huh. Done. Yeah. That's that's a it's a great story and a couple yeah. But of let me share something else we pulled off. We had to pivot in bold, and we had forty one thousand live attendees. We had to build a platform. We had to build the Zoom platform. We had to do the marketing. We had to do the training on that. We pulled off forty one thousand for one month four times a week. Can you believe that? Oh Nobody that. Nobody's that's, that. uh, that's what for it. That's about a, a fourth of your, your, your number of agents. Where are, what's your agent count? I'm, I'm about one. Probably about one hundred and 157 to 165, somewhere in there. Kind All of right. rates, you so know, 25% of your agent count went through the digital uh, virtual uh, bold training. Right. We've got another one coming up now too. So, so we pivoted, our bold coaches used to go on the road, mm -hmm. these in market centers for six weeks, one every Tuesday, every Tuesday, every Tuesday. Okay. And come March, I went, we're not on the road, got to change. So we called it bold pivot. So what I want to share with everyone is that there's an amazing opportunities out here. There's amazing ways to reach people, to communicate. And the digital world makes it faster, easy, and so much more efficient. And, and it's like, what you have to learn is that it is showtime when you're on a screen. You're a TV producer. And yeah, this is my office, but I've got an $18 lamp here. I got another $18 lamp there. I didn't spend a lot of money, sure. but I, I, got, I got yelled at, so to speak, from our events team going, you need to fix your lighting. You need to do this. You need to do that. And so you, this showtime, guys, and you know that when you're dealing with luxury, you always look your best, your car's always clean, and you know, you've got to walk the talk, look the talk. You got to do the same thing on screen. Yeah. You bring it on screen. You got to make that connection on screen. Yeah, those are great points. And you know, last year, Monica, we did 34 live trainings across, you know, Canada, U.S., and Mexico. And uh, it's not a scientific poll, but the old hand raised poll. And and I would tell you, 10 to 20 percent of our audiences are consistently putting video out there at these live events. And and I mean, some of these are, you know, who's who in luxury real estate, and some of these big top producing teams and agents are there. And and so you know, the the video train, it's not a fad. The video train is here to stay. And you know, you build up trust, you build up authenticity. I love telling the quote all the time from Daniel Kamen, Nobel Peace Prize winner. He says, people would rather do business with someone they like and they trust versus someone they don't. Even if that likable person is offering a higher quality product and service at a higher price, excuse me, a lower quality product and right. service at a higher price. And so I teach agents, of course, to, to offer both, right? A higher quality product, okay, and bring more value to the table. But but video, people feel like they know you, they like you, you know, your conversion will skyrocket. Um, what other tips while we're talking about video have you picked up? Because this is the new norm for you since March 13th. And you talked about early on, your lighting wasn't good. So same thing, our first luxury lunch and learn, we had Megan Barry on April 10th. And this is when in Illinois, I'm based in Illinois, 
we, we had a really strict shelter in place and my wife didn't let me leave the house. So literally I shot it from my master bedroom. The lighting was terrible. And as you can see, Monica, in each episode, you know, when things loosened up, now I'm at my new office. But my point is, what have you learned just personally from video and interacting through this pandemic? You know, there's just some fun things. I mean, obviously you can't be shooting out of your bedroom. That looks dumb, right? And you got to make sure your background is right. And some of the the fake backgrounds that you can put up are fine, but you don't want to have a beach scene. You know, the waters are waving and all, you know, I mean, you want to be a professional. So just have a professional background and you have to dress professionally. Usually I have shorts or pajama bottoms on. I mean, I dress from the top up like everybody else right now, right? I've been yeah. doing that. And so you always still want to look professional. I get up, I do my hair, my makeup, and I go to work every day. Uh -huh. Another thing, I'm going to tell you a fun story. This luxury agent, um, she was telling me about what she did. She used to have all these wine tasting parties, and she'd get these little groups together and all that. So guess what she did? This is I love the cleverness of everybody because you have to be clever and you have to be innovative and think outside the box. So she, she has the wine guy shop that she loves, and he sells cheese and wine, right? He's one of those, what do they call it, sommelier? I don't know. Yeah, what sommelier, that. yeah. Yeah, that guy. And so she put together, she would call, she would say, okay, two couples, she'd call, and she'd say, I'd like you to bring to the Zoom call Friday night, we're going to have a wine and cheese tasting party. My wine sommelier will be on the call. I want you to bring one guest each, you know, a couple. And I'll deliver it. We'll have the wine and cheese delivered there. He gets on. He talks to them. He engaged them. Now she's got two luxury people. She's got two other new luxury people she didn't know. And they have like an hour, hour and a half wine and cheese tasting party. And it's hilarious fun. That's now great. she's supporting your wine and cheese guy. He was about ready to tank, right? Right. And yet she's doing this every Friday. And she does it now every Wednesday night. And so... She's growing this, and people go, how do I get on that wine and cheese tasting party, right? You is know, it ever how people are? Yeah, you talked about the I care call. I mean, this is a, hey, have nothing to do with real estate, uh, you know, Zoom call with the, with the wine, but it's just bringing value, staying top of mind awareness. That, that's brilliant. Yeah, it's fun. It's fun. What else? Um, any words of advice for agents or team leaders uh, looking to, or market centers looking to launch luxury divisions or break into luxury? You know, um, that's always a great, great question. And, and I just, I'm going to take it back to a single agent first, okay? So then I want to make sure that then that single agent that they're, and I've had numerous conversations and I'll tell you about two really good success stories. And I said, well, first of all, you got to walk the talk, look the talk. You got to hang out with that group. You got to get involved in those charities. You got to start mixing, right? And I said, get, get, a, list, get a listing. Okay, well, maybe you can, I, don't, I don't know if I can do that. Okay, fine. Go hold open houses in, K, in a luxury. So if you can't hold an open house in luxury right now, get permission to do an open house at that, that you're videotaping, sending out to people, et cetera, or you're putting it on, on Facebook, take a look at. Figure out the other part of that. What I'm getting at is you got to get in front of people who are luxury buyers and sellers. And so the first case place was always hang out with, you know, an open house uh, and having one, do one for someone who has one. The second thing is, is that join some um, opportunities or charities. And I know I'm talking you know, before COVID happened, and I apologize, but you have to think whatever I'm saying, how does that look now? How are these charities still performing? A lot of them are still doing Zoom calls. A lot of them are still getting together and, and doing volunteer work and those sort of things. So you've got to go where you believe that you can meet those people. Um, one agent that I know was a really good tennis player, and so he made sure that he got in the tennis club and he started playing. I know great luxury agents who are great golfers that all they do is go golf and get a listing. I mean, what a perfect life that is, you know, yeah. and it's about, you know, why do you want to be a luxury agent? And then is, if that's your market, you can't, you can't do it in a, a, a year, be all of a sudden I'm a luxury agent. It's a path. It's, it's, you've got to learn the market. You've got to be the expert on the market. 
My favorite story is my son decided to be in real estate. He's been in real estate 12 years now. And I said, okay. And he goes, okay, I'm going into real estate. And I go, okay, well, go over to Keller Williams and sign up. He goes, no, 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 no. I'm not going there. He goes, because I want to go here in Austin, which was a big luxury brand. And I said, well, you got to start somewhere, Clay. Learn how to do this. And he goes, no, nope, not going to do that. No, nope, no. Nope. So he went and worked at that company. And he ended up working on the number one team. And long story short, he learned the systems. He learned everything. Um, he is now a Keller Williams agent. And last month, he sold a $25 million house and also another 14 million the last two weeks. So the luxury market in, in Austin is red hot. We got all these California refugees coming in, don't want to stay there, don't want to pay the 14% state income tax. But he's now built that reputation and that clientele. Now, he's been an agent, I think, 14 years or so. It, like I said, it's not an easy path because it's not like it's kind of like in luxury, it's who you know and who's got the splash out there, who's got the branding. And some of you don't have, when you first get in, you don't have the money to do the branding. You don't have the money to set up all of these different cocktail parties at a country club and invite people. And so it's a, it's a pathway. And so I don't want anyone to think that it's a short thing. There's a gal, there was a number one cobalt. No. There's, there's no easy button. I'm, I'm holding up this, uh, yeah. this easy button. Everybody's looking for the easy button, Monica. Yeah, so so listen to this. There, Karen Bernardi is a famous name. She was number one in Remax for a while, number one in Cobalt Banker, and she still does a bang-up business and works about six months a year. And and uh, she said, I'm breaking into luxury, and I was coaching her at the time. Oh, good luck with that. She's in Boulder, Colorado. And uh, she says, how do I do it? And I said, I don't know. Go door knock it. She goes, well, some of them aren't gated. And I said, perfectly. Go door knock it. She's door knocking it. You know, I've got an agent that I've coached the five, six years. He door knocks luxury listings. He made a million nine last year. He door knocks a hundred doors a day. He talks to 30 people a day. He has now switched into phoning and he doesn't like it, but he's still holding his own. Huh. But, you know, it's like, well, go after it. You yeah. know, there's you no, there's no easy button. in both of those examples, um, you know, you, I tell agents all the time, shy real estate agents have skinny kids, right? Monica, you can't be shy <laughs> in this industry. You gotta step out of your comfort zone a little bit. Exactly. Um, a couple other questions I have. Uh, thank you, by the way, for again, your time. Uh, sure. If you, if you Good. or your son in this example were to move to a new state, you know, you, you're both down there uh, in Austin, right? You're in Austin? I am in Austin. Yeah. yeah. You, so you, you moved to, from Austin to you name it, doesn't really matter for the sake of this conversation. What would be the first two or three things that you'd recommend to your son or a top agent or yourself uh, to you know, hit the ground running and establish yourself as a top luxury agent? You know, the, somebody said, nobody, nobody's gonna like me on this call, but I'll tell you what I did. I was a full-time coach for the Mike Ferry organization for a zillion years. And then Chris Heller asked me to come run his team which I did and, you know, sold over a couple hundred houses every single, I was a listing agent and running the team. And here's, I would never have said, okay, I'm going to go to San Diego and sell real estate. Joining a team and what my son did was probably a really smart thing. And a lot of us have our ego so out of whack. I didn't care what name was on the door. I just wanted to make money. I wanted to learn San Diego. So basically I got dropped into Chris's office. All the systems were there from mine from the perfect assistant. And so it was an easy transition. But Michael, if I had gone into San Diego and said, hi, I'm Monica Reynolds, you know, blah, 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 blah. I mean, I have the skills, but I didn't have the reputation. I didn't have the phone ringing. I didn't have, you know, the systems in place. So why go build all that? Join a team with, you know, in the back of your head, if that works great, if not, Think about when you're going to make that move. My son made that move. It was the right time to make the move, and it was time to go and build his own team. So if you're going to move to a new area, doesn't it seem, sound right, Michael? Let somebody give you a hand up instead of trying to, you know, in the wall? Yeah, that's, that's, that's great advice, Monica, I, and, and I don't disagree with you. That's one of the things we teach agents as well. Um, 
you know, and, and your son went to another brokerage, you know, how, you know, a lot of times we did a virtual uh, luxury designation training last week and during the question and answer, and this wasn't on some of the questions we talked about, but I'd love to get your thoughts on this. But, you know, there's a lot of misconceptions and limiting beliefs that, that agents have or teams have. And, and many times, even your son, sometimes they think they have to be with a certain brand or brokerage to sell luxury. And I tell agents all the time, hey, if you're with a successful brand that sells a lot of luxury, of course, leverage that. But with your, if you're with a boutique or a company that really isn't known for luxury or maybe in that particular market doesn't have a lot of market share, that's okay too. Understand the competition. Of course, you never talk bad about them, but know what the unique value proposition that you bring to the table as well as your brokerage and, and, and turn it into a positive. Uh, would you agree with that? Because I, I know that there's you know, it doesn't matter if it's Keller Williams, Cobalt Banker, XYZ Realty, but there's some brands that are stronger in luxury in their given market than, than other brands. Uh, and, and what advice would you have for, you know, those that struggle with their brand's identity within luxury? Gosh, you know, I just say keep it simple and do the right thing. Win, win, make it a win for the client all the time. Do the right thing. Show up professionally. Care about the client. It's like, you know, when you look at making a transition to any company, the people I've always believed hire you. They don't really hire the company. And so when someone says, well, I'm only going to hire this luxury company, you know, I always say, you know, if an agent thinks like that, that they're only going to hire this brand or that brand, don't do that. Think about who you are and how you project yourself. Uh, my son left a really, you know, the number one boutique, number one luxury um, company that sells all the luxury in Austin. And he personally did like 50 million last year on his own. And then it was hard for him to break away because he had friends, he had family there. And he, they became family. It was a sure. community. And yet it was time for him to go get a new challenge. And, and so he, ha he didn't steal people but people figured out where he was and he's, they've reached out and, you know, then they say, Hey, you got to talk to my friend. They're doing something. So when you're who you are and people know that and your brand is that you're professional, your brand is that you're knowledgeable. You should know everything about a contract. You should be the finest negotiator. You should role play negotiation. You know, people want to know that they are dealing with a super, super smart person. And what happens is, is that you can get smelled out really quickly. Not saying that luxury has really super smart people. Let's say that they built businesses, they have a pretty good idea who knows their stuff. If you don't know the stats of the market, you don't understand price per square foot. You don't understand why that house sold for that and that house down the lake over here sold for that. And here's the four reasons why it didn't. You have to be extremely knowledgeable. You can't let that buyer or that seller know more about real estate than you. If that happens, they won't use you again, or they may not continue to use you. you and it's, so it's about the knowledge of the market. It's about the statistics. And it's you study it every day. You're looking at those homes every day. You're understanding why that home sold for that per, per square footage. And if you don't, call the agent and say, you've got a record price. What's the deal on that? Uh -huh. That you can say to a client, hey, Michael, I understand why that house got a record price. Here's the buyer that came into town and here's why he was willing to pay that. Yeah, no, knowing the story being, you, you, you talk about knowledge. I tell agents, grow your knowledge and your confidence will grow, but, but also being able to articulate it. Um, so obviously you're very well spoken. You've coached tons of hours, ton, thousands of agents, thousands of hours. Talk to me a little bit about storytelling and do you uh, recommend, when I say storytelling, I'm talking about, you know, analogies, parables, you know, whatever it might be to hammer home points, uh, being knowledgeable, but also being able to tell stories or similar case studies or similar situations like, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you know, your situation is very similar to someone we just recently helped. Uh, they chose this and they were successful. Like, talk to me a little bit about uh, that because many agents I've found that we've coached through the years, uh, they struggle a little bit with being direct and being honest 
because they don't want to offend, they, they don't want to upset the sellers. And so a lot of times they're, they're puppets. They do what the, the owner tells them to do versus say, you know, well, I'll do, you know, you're, you're the, you're the seller and, and ultimately it's your decision, but here's what I'm, I'm recommending and here's why. So how do you coach up agents to be able to articulate their knowledge? You know, I always think that you start with building rapport and it's about how you convey that I'm on your side, Michael. I understand why you wrote this offer. And I also want to convey to you and share with you the seller's perspective of why they're rejecting it and countering back. And so you've got to make sure in all of any kind of stories that you get into and any kind of conversations or negotiating, are you their number one client? Or do you have their interest at heart? Do they smell that you want the commission more than you want to do the right thing? And I, you know, I hear stories from all these luxury agents on these 10, 20, $30 million homes and they're like a hundred thousand dollars apart. And personally, I'm thinking 30 million, what's a hundred thousand dollars? Isn't that like a hundred dollars? I don't know. Right. I don't know 30 million. Right. And yeah. so it's like, come on, you guys. And so yet, you, you have to fight for that guy writing that $30 million a listing that he's, or that, that's writing an offer on a $30 million house who's asking for, you know, the Ferrari in the garage, which wasn't part of the deal. But you've got to understand that you've got to build that rapport and you've got to be able to say to him, can we talk about this? They really want to sell their house. And you've got to build that rapport that, you know, they've got to trust you. Can I make a recommendation? that we leave the car off at this time, you know, and here's why, and here's some of the situations that I've got myself into. The car is not part of what they want to sell. So you've got, you got to do it with a nice, kind, gentle, I'm your counselor. As a professional, may I share with you, you know, what, what I would like you to consider. So you never tell somebody, you can't do this. You say, I'd like you to consider this. Uh -huh. And here's what the end goal is, Michael. You do want that house. On a scale of one to 10, how bad do you want that house? You know, and if they say seven or eight, yeah, I'd go, that's a great number. And I'm going to myself, ah! you know, <laughs> I have to say 10, right? Right, right. Whatever they say, that's a great number. And that's the focus of what we're talking about today. Let's get that house. I love it. So I'd like you to consider this. I wrote that down and, and I'm a big one to 10, you know, on scales of one to 10. I love asking that, not just, you know, during the, the, the listing appointment, uh, but also throughout the transaction because motivation changes, right? Not just for buyers, but also sellers. Yeah. And it's knowing who they are. And, you know, this, this is about us talking about, you know, you owning that home and about having your children have that backyard with the pool and the waterfall. And this is about being in that school district where you can send your kids to that private school. So I'm gluing everything in that they want about that house. And then I'll say, you're not getting the Ferrari and I'll do it in a nice way. Right. 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 You know, yeah, and, and so, that's where, that's where dispersonality comes into as well. Right. Understanding oh, yeah. if they're drivers or, you know, if they're, if they're more left brain analytical and they're number crunchers and, and uh, really understanding your clients is really important. Uh, it's absolutely. Talk to me about 2020 versus 2008. You know, I have a finger on multiple pulses and we're seeing the luxury market in, in many markets. I was talking to an agent last week from Houston, a Keller Williams agent, and she said they were getting more activity on their million dollar plus property mm -hmm. from the last month than the previous year. In Chicago, we're seeing the same thing, that the suburban homes, the multi-million dollar properties, you know, multiple offers, which we haven't seen in 15 years here. Uh, what are you seeing? You know, your, your maps coaching, what are some of your top yeah. markets seeing? And, and your yeah, I still, yeah, markets. I, I still, I, I lead maps, but I'm also a coach because I like to keep my finger in the pulse. So I have a few clients and I've got a couple of luxury in Florida. Um, these gals, separate agents are off the charts in business. They don't know what what happened but their their head is about to explode they've got so much business going on right now that's a second home market so here's my thoughts on that and you guys are already figured this out too just to repeat it is that people can't go to europe i used to travel at least four times a year to europe or africa or somewhere i was speaking and i'm, I'm going anywhere this year right 
And so let's say that there is a, a luxury client and they used to travel to Mexico. They go to the Bahamas, St. Thomas, St. Bart's, whatever, Europe a couple of times. They're not going anywhere. So they're looking for that second home in the mountains in Colorado. They're looking for, you know, Alice Beach in Destin, Florida, or Rosemary Beach. Rosemary, yeah. I've got a, a guy I was just talking to the other day in Michigan, sold a $3 million house and he's got two $2 million houses on under contract right outside of Detroit somewhere. And I'm going, what the heck? It's on a lake somewhere. Sure. And Wisconsin is on fire on the lake. So it's the yeah. same home market luxury that's out of control because these guys don't know where to fly to because Europe won't take us. You can't go to the Bahamas anymore. You really can't leave the country. But so we're going to go find a place to put our family, our friends and, and have them come in. And so the, it's that's probably drivable too, right? Are you, are you finding somewhere drivable within their primary residence? Totally drivable. And so that's the other thing. People are looking at how far is it for me to drive from Texas to Park City, Utah? You know, I could make it in a day and a half or a day and a half to bail. I mean, the people are, even though you got a place in Texas, they're going other places. You got a place in Colorado, they're going somewhere else. I've got someone I know lives in Colorado and they're driving across country and they've rented a house for two months in Hilton Head and if they like it, they're gonna buy one. I mean, people want a different location that can afford it. So a good luxury agent is saying, where's your next home? Mm -hmm. The best Facebook ad, Michael, I know I'm, I'm charged up here. The best, <laughs> one of the best Facebook ads I got, it was text to me, it said, um, could you buy, I don't know where it is, but it said something about uh, how much would this cost in LA? And it's this 8,000 square foot mansion, 16 acres on the lake. And it was like free. I mean, it was 8,000 square feet of a guest house. It was 3,000 square feet. It was like a couple million dollars. And, you know, and they put a Facebook ad like that in, in LA and they got like, like 180 leads on that. No. Yeah, that's a great thing about you know targeting and, and, and with Facebook, right? You can create an ad and get in Austin, and and your demographic might be in LA, and, and right. So that's a whole nother uh, luxury lunch. Yeah, but life. and then luxury, these guys have the money to roll around and think, yeah, let's go get a second house for a while, and if they never go to it again, it's okay in most cases sometimes, or they'll sell it another time. They don't care. And, you know, hey, that'd be fun to go to Michigan and have a boat there. And, hey, you know, that's where our family was from a long time ago. Let's go check that out. Yeah. So don't be afraid to be looking at Facebook and networking with other agents. And it's asking your clients right now, where would you like another home? Where have you been thinking about? I can connect you with a great agent. You know, I, there's just so much opportunity with luxury uh, owners right now, too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, they're sitting in their house and they're never going to leave. Where do they want to go next? Yeah. And, and the other part of that, which, uh, you know, we've talked about on other programs is the fact that with e-learning and, and uh, work from home, and you're seeing a lot of these, these C-level executives that aren't going down to the major cities anymore. They're working from home. They have a little bit more flex in their schedule. So that's why in Chicagoland, we're seeing some of the suburban markets that were stale and definitely buyer's markets. Now they've, they've flipped because of COVID-19. Yeah. A lot of them, the house is too big or the house is too small, or I'm going to be in a home office. I need a different, different house that supports something like yeah. that. Yeah. It's crazy. That is crazy. Um, 2020 versus 2018. That was, I started asking this question, you know, what's the biggest difference that you see in, in the economy versus 2008 and the, the recession that we had here in the States versus of course 2020, which is, a, it's a global. Well, let me answer it this way. Um, if you know those markets, you know those markets. And if you didn't know those markets, just know that this recession that we are in and going in stronger is going to be like nothing else. You've got the pandemic, you've got civil unrest, You've got people who have kids who don't know if they're going to school, if the teachers are going to go to school, if they, even the kids show up. You got an election year. We got the nuttiest year known to history, right? There's nothing ever been like it. And so with that said, you've got to be looking all the time at opportunities. And so, so here's the thing. 
somebody says, well, what, what should my schedule look like? And I go, well, why did it change? You have a schedule, you know, your goal is to go on appointment every single day. Do that. Whether it's Zoom or whatever. You have a schedule that you do X amount of contacts, that you do this amount of marketing. Do that. Don't stop what you were doing. And the agents who have thrived, succeeded at the highest level, in fact, doing more business than they've ever done, is that they didn't sit on the couch and go, wow, March 13th, look how awful this is. They started calling their clients. Hey, I'm just calling to say, I care about you. How's it going? How's your family? What are your plans the next few weeks? Because we all thought this would be over, right? What's going on at your office? And then they're continuing those I care calls. And now you have to understand, even in luxury, in the month of July, one out of three people who have a loan or pay a lease did not pay the month of July, rather. The month of July, one out of three did not pay. It's, it's projected that there will be 28 million people in pre-foreclosure by September. What if I'm off a few million? Maybe it's October, Jeez. right? Yeah. But I'm preparing you that we've never seen a recession like this. The $600 that people were getting extra who filed for unemployment, it's over on Saturday. What is that going to do? What is that going to do? And the COVID money, there might be a little bit left there, but, you know, and if the government does print some more money, basically, what is that going to do? Right. So instead of being scared, just be knowing what's happening and looking toward the future. And, you know, we had GoDaddy.com was here. 300 people got let up go a couple of weeks ago. Hardly any notice at all. Well, I would have thought to myself as a luxury agent, who owns the GoDaddy? Who's the leadership over there? Who's the director of this and that? I ought to be looking into who, who owns GoDaddy and what they plan on doing. Yeah. Maybe they like to relocate and downsize. Mm -hmm. Where are they? Yeah. And so you have to be looking at the future and looking at your community. Who's, who's going to be affected the most? Yeah. And there's, a, there's been a lot of people that have been positively affected with this. I have some people in medical sales and various industries, and they are thriving at this time. So this, the, the flip side of this is they might be the, the buyers looking to expand and, and grow something larger. So looking at all different opportunities uh, and, and being and why not And why not be talking about to your luxury buyers? A lot of them pay cash, but would you like to refinance your house at 3% or less? There's out there like that. You guys know that. I don't have yeah. to tell you. Yeah. That might be someone goes, wow, I need to do that. It looks like I might be losing my job or downsizing. I'm going to pull a million out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go get it. It's free money out there at two and a half, 2.6. I know someone who refinanced a luxury home at 2.6 about a month ago, 30 year fixed. How That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. But as a, as a salesperson, as a realtor, what's your value proposition? Are you letting people know what jumbo loans are out there? And by saying, I don't know if you need it or you want it, I just want it as part of my customer service to let you know I have a lender. I know someone who could help you if you ever needed you know, to look at refinancing, if that was a possibility. A lot of them will say no and some will go, gosh, you know, I need to think about that. They call you the next day and say, hey, I want to talk to that lender and see what that looked like. Well, you bring up a good point. You're staying top of mind awareness. You're bringing value. You're not trying to sell them anything because you're not a lender. You're just offering a great resource. You want to be that I got a guy person. Exactly. Yeah. So what is your value proposition? How do you keep them top of mind that you are letting them know what's happening to the market? If the market is red hot. So I said to this one coach, <clears throat> excuse me, client. I'm a coach. She's the client. And I said, you just sold a $6 million house. I said, go call all those $6 million houses and say, you have four more buyers who want to buy a house that now if they want to buy, it's the top of the market. And, and then ask them opinion, ask the opinion. So in a luxury buyer seller, they're very opinionated. I just uh -huh. thought, right. And I say, I value your opinion, Michael. Tell me where you think the economy, the United States, the next six months, where are we going? Do you feel the value of your home will stabilize or do you feel there might be some challenges in the luxury market? Mm -hmm. And some people don't care and that's fine too. 
and there will be some who do. But you as a guru of information, you as a guru of a, being a professional, this is where your value proposition comes in, that you know that information. And if they need any kind of information about what's happening to the market, you've already proactively let them know. That's great. Absolutely. Be proactive versus reactive. Monica, if someone wants to find out more information about Keller Williams, Keller Williams Maps Coaching, uh, where's the best place for them to go? You know what? I got a simple email. It's Monica, M-O-N-I-C-A at KW.com. Love to talk to anybody about anything. And if you have any questions for me, I don't want to frustrate anybody on my thoughts. I'm pretty opinionated. I've been doing this for 40 years. Sorry. Sometimes I, you know, it's just pretty black and white for me. The bottom line is I don't care if you're luxury or you're buying a mobile home. Treat them with respect and know more than they do. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Have a great rest of your Friday, and we'll get you the recording of this, Monica. Great. I'm happy to share it out. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Have a great, Have a great, great Friday. Year. Thank you. Bye-bye.